Our goal in the next few webcasts is to use the reactivity of carbohydrates that we've already discussed to determine the structure of oligomers of the monosaccharides, the oligosaccharides. In particular, we can use reactions we've already seen to fully describe the structure of disaccharides, which contain two monosaccharide units connected via an oxygen atom. Let's quickly review how we number the open chain and cyclic monosaccharides in order to understand how we name the disaccharides. The anomeric carbon, which corresponds to the carbonyl carbon in the open chain form, is designated as the 1 position. From there, we simply move down the chain of carbons and number the subsequent carbons 2, 3, 4, etc. We'll see that polymers of the monosaccharides are described using this numbering system to designate the carbons that are connected through an oxygen atom. Before diving into the chemistry behind structure elucidation of the disaccharides, I'd like to point out that the disaccharides are an important class of carbohydrates that we see on a daily basis. Sucrose is just table sugar and is composed of glucose and fructose linked through their 1 and 2 positions, respectively. Maltose is another example of a sugar commonly found in food products and consists of two glucose molecules linked through their 1 and 4 positions. Cellobiose is the basic constituent of the structural polysaccharide cellulose, which is one of the most abundant organic materials on Earth. Cellobiose contains two glucose monomers linked through their 1 and 4 positions. In the next few webcasts, we'll concern ourselves with lactose, whose structure I'll leave a mystery for the moment. Our goal is to use analytical data and chemical reactions to determine the structure of lactose. First of all, Let's imagine that elemental analysis revealed to us the molecular formula of lactose, C12H22O11. The 12 carbons suggest that the compound is a disaccharide composed of two hexosugars. If we examine the structure of a related known disaccharide for a moment, we can see that the acetal functional group is a critical part of the connection between the sugars. Under acidic conditions, we might imagine cleavage of one of the key carbon-oxygen bonds through an exocyclic bond cleavage mechanism analogous to the similar mechanism for mutarotation that we've already seen. As an aside, this breaking bond and the other bridging carbon-oxygen bond are called glycosidic linkages. Cleaving a glycosidic bond would be useful for us because we could then separate and characterize the resulting monosaccharides to get an idea of the likely structure of the disaccharide. Placing lactose under acidic aqueous conditions, which promote the hydrolysis mechanism just described, yields one equivalent each of D-glucose and D-galactose. From this information, we know that lactose is composed of these two sugars. However, we still don't know which two carbons are connected via glycosidic linkages. Because the acid worked to cleave the disaccharide, we do know that an anomeric position on one of the sugars must be involved in the glycosidic linkage. No other positions in the sugar can support stabilized cations under these acidic hydrolysis conditions like the anomeric position can. However, which sugar is linked through its anomeric position remains a mystery to us at this point. In the next webcast, we'll finish solving the mystery of the structure of lactose. Three key questions remain. Which sugar is linked through the anomeric position, or C1? Which hydroxyl group of the other sugar is involved in the glycosidic linkage? And what is the configuration of the anomeric carbon involved in the glycosidic linkage? We'll have to make full use of the typical reactivity of carbohydrates in order to solve this mystery.